Potter, The Building of Frank Lloyd Wright's Masterpiece by Mark Mark Harshman and Anna Egan Smucker, art by Leon Pham. published by Roaring Book Press. So Frank Lloyd Wright said, no house should ever be on a hill or on anything. It should be of the hill, belonging to it. Hill and house should live together, each the happier for the other. So he thinks that a house and nature should live in harmony. Frank Lloyd Wright was the most famous architect in the world, but by 1934, he was just old. Someone even said he was dead, but he wasn't. But it had been years since he had built anything newsworthy. A stream in Pennsylvania was about to change all of that. Flowing fast and cold, tumbling over dark rocks, between rugged hills rushes a stream called Bear Run. In the office of his Pittsburgh department store, Edgar Kaufman thinks of building a new house. Factory smoke swirls outside his window, streetcars noisy, clangs fill the air, and he writes a letter. Dear Mr. Wright, I think I have a project for you in mind. Could you please come for a visit? Welcome to Pittsburgh, Mr. Kaufman says, but let's hurry. It's Bear Run, and I really want you to see. Wright hears a thunder of a waterfall and sees rocks stepping up a hillside, sees water rushing over ledges into pools below. Campfires have been built on that big rock for hundreds of years, Kaufman says, and Wright sees that fire-lit rock is the heart of a house. For a long time, Frank Lloyd Wright has dreamed of building a house by a waterfall, and now he will have his chance. A week later, he writes to Kaufman for maps showing every rock and tree and says, Visit to the waterfall in the woods stays with me, and, I, and a dwelling for you has taken shape in my mind. In the spring and summer, Wright comes to Bear Run to look again and again at the land and how the water falls. The slopes are steep. He will have to build up. He imagines a tower from it and the rocky cliff the house must grow. Back in Wisconsin, Wright puts on his hat, takes up his cane, and walks the countryside. But he is not seeing Wisconsin. He is seeing falling waters of Bear Run. In dreaming this house, he will use everything he has ever seen. Stone walls from Wisconsin, sand and adobe from the southwest, towers and trellises from Italy, art prints from Japan, and he wants to hear the waterfall in every room of the house and to see sunlight fill every space. In his workroom, Wright studies the maps, notes the stream, the falls, each rock and tree, but he does not put pencil to paper, not yet. Instead, he dreams. It has been nine months since Wright first saw Bear Run. Mr. Kaufman calls. He is in Wisconsin. He is coming to visit. He wants to see the plans. He will arrive in two hours. He's coming to see his new house. Wright's assistants are very worried because there are no plans, and plans can take months. But Wright is ready. His dreams have made him ready. He sees every boulder, tree, and waterfall. He sees the house that will live among them. His assistants are ready too, big sheets of paper ready. Then, pencils, flash. Wright talks softly to himself. Erase, erase. Paper crumples, flies. Pencils break. Resharpen, lines, crosses, crisscrosses, connect. Shapes appear, a house like no other. Magic. A house like no other, where sun can shine, where balconies fly, where falling water is heard from every room. Wright finishes with a flourish, and Mr. Kaufman, Kaufman knocks at the door. Our house on the waterfall. Yes. Kaufman orders the quarry open, and within months, men with crowbars and mallets begin to dig and haul sandstone for the house like no other. Pry and dig and lift, stone upon stone upon stone. Choose and fit and stack, stone upon stone upon stone. Workmen load rocks onto carts. Others trim stones, chip them for walls growing higher. Walls like the hills own stony ledges. Sand, cement, gravel. Mix, mix, pour. Now concrete wings and long flat roofs step up the hillside. and the thundering water, scaffolding spreads its spindly legs like branches extending from a tree. The house stretches out over the falls. 
Rock, concrete, glass, stone towers three stories tall, metal the red of an old Indian pot. The scaffolding is locked away and the dream flies free, soars over the water. Never has there been such a house. In December, the Kaufmans move in. At their holiday parties, pine branches fill the house with the smells of the forest. Like a lantern glowing in the trees, the house hangs in the darkness. Wright visits in the spring. In the early morning, before anyone is awake, he explores the house he has named Falling Water. He sees the living room just as he dreamed it, dark and low as the bear cave. He listens, and through the many windows comes the music of water, the tune always different, but always the same. The trees, the stream, the waterfalls are all still there, and this house looking like it grew right out of the rocks belonging. The flagstone floor like wet rocks in a stream, the large boulder jutting beside the fireplace, the heart of the house, just as he imagined on his very first visit. Out on a terrace, the moist air swirls around him. He leans over as far as he dares and dreams. And the house that flew still flies over waters, under skies, and somewhere someone dreams. So can I, so can I.